Trinity Week, of course, is uh, a showcase of the best that's going on today in Trinity and also about bringing in some of the best from the outside world to Trinity to challenge ourselves. Uh, so I hope tonight uh, will not only encourage you to look into the author's works, but also even more to look into the whole world of children's literature, youth novels, science fiction, uh, which after all is not only the theme tonight, but also a very important research theme at Trinity. Trinity Week, uh, overall program this year is about ideas for the future. Ideas for the future are very much needed now, uh, of course they always are, but uh, certainly we, all, uh, we are all in this mode now where we really are looking everywhere for new inspiration, new ideas, where should we be headed? And certainly, the ones who will actually have a chance to have a real impact on that future is the young generation. It's really important what we teach them, what ideas we try and implant in their heads, and how we engage with youth. So that's very important. And therefore, I'm really proud also that uh, this is an event that we could stage in association with the Children's Books Ireland uh, and uh, with the Dublin City Public Library. The Trinity Long Room Hub is a arts and humanities research institute and when you go out, outside of this lecture hall you cannot help but notice that a new building has gone up uh, on campus. It's, uh, it's a slim but proud statement of the importance of the arts and humanities. It's right outside when you leave this building and uh, look to the right. It's uh, a stunning uh, granite uh, <coughs> statement of the very best of Irish architecture and it will in the future stage many events like this one tonight, because it's really uh, a, a place where we will hope to bring in people from the outside and engage with the outside world. Trinity is very much a university in Dublin for Ireland. So I shouldn't spend more of our time tonight. Uh, I really should uh, invite uh, the co-host for tonight, uh, Tom Donegan, to just say a few words on behalf of children, children's books. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we're a little bit late getting started today, obviously, so uh, I won't uh, delay uh, what's going to be a fascinating conversation, I'm sure, uh, too long. Uh, I just wanted to extend on behalf of CBI um, uh, our welcome to you here tonight um, uh, to say what a great honour it is to be part of Trinity Week, and, and thank you very much uh, to the uh, Long Room uh, Hub for letting us be part of it this year. Um, it's, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce uh, uh, Philip Reeve to you this evening. Um, he's very, uh, very much one of my uh, favorite authors at the moment. Um, Philip told me earlier today that he doesn't travel very often, so I think it's a real sort of significant fact that he's here for us today, and uh, an added bonus that we're going to be able to enjoy his presence and, and the discussion that's about to unfold. Um, just to say before we get going, because Robert, I'm sure, is going to give you a far more detailed overview of uh, Philip's career. Um, the, Robert himself, uh, uh, this year, was, was honoured by Trinity College, and in a way, um, it's particularly fitting that we're all here today. Um, last year, uh, last July, um, uh, he was honoured with an uh, honorary doctorate by the college uh, in recognition of his work uh, with children's literature. Um, the statement that, that was uh, given by the college on the day, I'd just like to read it out because I think it's important that we acknowledge it here um, as well. This evening. Uh, Trinity said uh, that Robert was the doyen of children's literature in Ireland. He's been a key figure for the establishment of children's literature as an academic subject in Ireland and beyond. He has been the prolific face and voice of the study of children's literature on television, radio and in the newspapers. And to that I'd just like to say he's also been a good friend and mentor to me in the last few years of working with CBI as well. 
So uh, with that in mind, I'd like us to welcome both Philip and Robert uh, here this evening, and uh, let's hope this is a really wonderful, inspiring discussion between them. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Tom, indeed, and uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope the technology, uh, or the lack of technology, isn't going to diminish uh, the fun and so on of our conversation. Um, when you have written, published, in the course of nine years, 15 books, and when your total sales, I understand, are hovering around the 500,000 mark, and when you also uh, are always the subject of terrific reviews in the children's book world press, and on top of all that, when you have been shortlisted and indeed gone on to win virtually every prestigious award in the world of children's fiction, you really are a person of considerable significance in the children's literature world. Uh, Philip Reeve, our guest this evening, has won uh, so many awards that, to be honest with you, I had you write down a list of them because I knew I'd forget some of them. But among many other things, he has won the Blue Peter Book of the Year Award, he has won the Nestle Book Prize, he has won the Smarties Award, he has won the Guardian Children's Fiction Award, and of course, uh, in 2008, he has won the most prestigious, many people would say, of the lot, namely the Carnegie Medal, for what I was saying to him earlier this afternoon, is my own favorite Reeve book, namely Here Lies Arthur. So I think we are very lucky to have Philip with us this evening, and I'd like you to give him a further very warm Trinity welcome. <laughs> One of the aspects of Philip's work that we'll get around to, I hope, at some point later on, uh, because it's a little detail that absolutely fascinates me, is that he is a wonderful uh, facility for inventing the most wonderful names for his characters. He, he would put Dickens in most of his moods in the commonplace. He's wonderful at inventing characters' names. But he also uh, must have a considerable degree of prescience where this is concerned, because uh, th this event is being co-hosted by Children's Books Ireland, which, as we all know, is in the hands of three very capable people indeed. And all of them, by name, figure in Philip's work. <laughs> we have a Mags, we have a Jenny, a very important Jenny indeed, and of course, we have a Tom, all 15 years of him, who has a very significant role throughout various of the books. And not only that, but uh, in his wonderfully comic book called Lark Light, uh, there is a wonderful semi piratical figure called Jack Havoc which incidentally would be a wonderful name for my grandson, as it happens, who is also Jack. But among the crew on Jack Havoc's ship, we read that there were those two walking sea anemones, almost identical, with crowns of gently waving arms where their heads should have been, who did not talk but cooed and trilled like birds, they were Squidly and Yarg, the tentacle twins. And I thought, you invented Jedward as well. <laughs> <laughs> and that is only a foretaste, I can assure you, of what lies ahead name-wise. Uh, Philip, on the um, publicity material that has been circulated mm. about this event, uh, you're described as an award-winning science fiction and fantasy writer. And I thought I'd begin by asking you what those two terms, science fiction and fantasy, mean to you. How you interpret them, A, if you like, in the context of your own writing, and B, in more general terms. Ooh. 
Um, well, I was saying at the event I did this morning, it's very, um, it's very refreshing to be described as a science fiction writer because I'm, I think that's basically what I am. My, my natural tendency is to write fiction spun off from science, which I would think is science fiction. Uh, but it's, it's a term that in, um, in the UK doesn't really seem to be very respectable. I think people are rather frightened of it. Um, the broadsheets will happily review crime novels, but I don't think they review science fiction. Um, and people don't really admit to reading science fiction. It's regarded as a rather, uh, a rather boyish and foolish uh, genre. Um, so it's very pleasing to come over here and find that I think you have maybe a more European attitude to it. It's, uh, it seems to be you know, n not um, quite as shameful to be a science fiction writer here as it would be in London. Um, science fiction and fantasy were the genres that appealed to me most when I was sort of nine, between nine and 14 maybe, those very formative years. And after that, I, I stopped reading science fiction pretty much, and I went off and, and read all sorts of other things, proper books, grown-up books, as we think of them over there. Um, but when I started writing my own stories, I always seemed to come back to, to the sort of stories that I enjoyed during those childhood years, to science fiction and to fantasy. And I guess because I have no belief in the supernatural, I find it hard to suspend disbelief for long enough to write a, a pure fantasy full of magic and things. I'm quite happy to read one, um, but if I'm going to spend six, you know, sort of six months or a year writing something, I, 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 I tend to not want to do elves and pixies and wizards and spells. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I use science, which is very vague and strange and probably no different to magic, but I like to have that kind of basis in some sort of some sort of reality. Uh, on, the, on the science fiction thing, um, sometime last year, I think it was, uh, you gave an interview to one of our local uh, journalists, uh, Patrick Frey, in, mm. in the Sunday Tribune, and you were talking about uh, science fiction, and you were drawing what I thought at the time and, and continue to think is a very, very interesting distinction between it and various other genres. You say, uh, science fiction isn't about characters, it's about ideas, and that's what confuses critics. They're looking for depth of characterization, but science fiction does breadth of invention instead. I'm trying to square the circle and do both. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's I, ideally. Uh, sorry. That's ambitious. Uh, it, it is. I mean, I, I, I suppose because I, you know, I've read and enjoyed so much non-science fiction, so, you know, proper fiction. Um, I do like, you know, I do like depth of characterization, but certainly I think science fiction, it doesn't quite arise from the same place as other literature. Sci the science fiction I used to read, the kind of 50s American stuff, the, the Ray Bradbury's and Arthur C. Clarke's and people, that genre really began in kind of popular engineering magazines and, and you know, electrical engineer and things back, back before the First World War, I think. Um, and so it is, it, it is very much about ideas mm -hmm. and um, possibilities. And I, in some ways I find that quite liberating because it isn't. Um, people don't read it thinking, oh, what a wonderful reference yes. to uh, William Faulkner. Um, mm -hmm. They're just after the ideas. And, and it, it, growing up, I found it was, um, I would have felt, I, I don't come from a, a literary family or, or from a, a, sort of a particular sort of university educated kind of family. I'm from a very ordinary lower middle class background, and I would have um, not felt confident to set out to write a book, to, to write a novel. But I could imagine myself writing a science fiction novel, because it's a whole different thing, and it's sort of, sort of lower class somehow, <laughs> and it seemed like something I could do. And indeed, the science fiction community was, there were, um, I presume they still do, they used to hold a big uh, convention every Easter, and sometimes it was at a hotel in Brighton, which is where I grew up, and you could buy a day ticket and go in and meet all these authors you'd heard of and, and authors you hadn't heard of who you would then hear talk and think, oh, he's fantastic, and go out and buy his book. And I wasn't aware of any way in which, as a, as a sort of spotty 13-year-old, I could have met the great literary figures of the time, but I could meet great science fiction writers and sit down and talk with them, um, more or less as an equal. So in a way, it was very, 
it was very welcoming, very welcoming sort of literary community. And I think that's probably where my, where my liking for it comes from, really, my, or, or my continued liking for it. Well, uh, maybe when we later look at some of the individual books, we'll come back to some of the specific ideas mm. that you might be uh, engaging with. But you mentioned Brighton there, and you gave us one or two little biographical uh, details. Um, in the various um, bits that are added on so funnily to your uh, Larklight trio, uh, you talk about the background that you've just described. And I have to say that, uh, while I'm sure there is a bit of tongue-in-cheek uh, going on here, uh, Brighton doesn't come out of things terribly well. Uh, you refer to it at one point as the bustling seaside slum, and you refer to it another as that vile town. <laughs> And in another context uh, that I came across, you, you referred in passing uh, to uh, the bleak, comprehensive that you attended. Now, convince us that it was as bad as that. <laughs> well, of course it wasn't. I had, a, I had a very happy childhood, but somewhere quite early on, I picked up this sort of romantic uh, love of, <coughs> excuse me, of kind of wild upland landscapes. And there I was stuck in Brighton, and I wanted to be in the Lake District or Scotland or, or Dartmoor or Cornwall or somewhere. So um, it was frustrating, really. I, I really only spent sort of two or three weeks a year there when we would go off on family holidays. And the rest of the time I was, I was, I was in Brighton and kind of disliking it quite a lot. Although, uh, you know, as I say, I, I had friends in the park down the road and quite a, quite a happy upbringing. And as for the Bleak Comprehensive, it was, it was very, you know, it was a rough, a rough old school and um, it, it, when, when the, uh, when, when the um, British government started um, producing a, uh, um, a, a league table of schools, I was always very proud to see that um, Stanley Deason, which was my, old, my alma mater, always featured in the bottom ten in the <laughs> entire country. And after a while, I think they brought in a, a super head who was supposed to turn it round, but she turned to drink instead. And um, <laughs> after that, they gave up and they, they closed it down and, and salted the ground whereon it stood. But I had actually a very... For a, a, a writer, a, a, a would-be artist, I had a very happy very happy time there because the academic standards were quite low so just by being moderately intelligent I was instantly a kind of star pupil so I didn't really have to do any work so there was none of that nonsense I just hung around in the art room and I got together with my little gang of friends and we wrote little plays and comedy shows and things so it was really the kind of free um, uh, sort of self-directed education that very rich hippies pay for their children to have uh, uh, sort of cranky schools, but I got it um, through the state at this, at this grim comprehensive. So it was great. I, I had a good time there. Good. Well, I, I'm very glad to hear it, I must say. Um, well, you're, you mentioned art there, and that eventually took you to uh, College of Art mm. in, in Cambridge, uh, where I understand, in addition to pursuing your studies, you were involved in a lot of... Uh, student productions and comedy sketches mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing um, in various groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the most picturesquely named groups that I've come across for some time was that you collaborated at uh, one point uh, with some of your, your colleagues in something called the Charles Atlas Sisters. What in yes. heaven's name were they doing? Well, um, in retrospect, it, it, it sounds gayer than it actually was. <laughs> um, it, we, we, we used, I think there was an open, a sort of open mic night at one of the uh, student union bars in Cambridge, and we used to occasionally go along, and there would be you know, different groups of us, so we would form a little, a little, um, a little sort of troupe for the night, and we would give ourselves different names, and uh, sometimes this would sort of bumble on for a few months and we'd do a show or two. So we were the authorities for a while and we were, we were it's only a fiver until we worked out that people thought that was the admission <laughs> price and wouldn't come and see us. And then for a while we were the Charles Atlas sisters and I can't for the life of me remember why. It just seemed to chime with a certain sort of um, vague kind of 50s nostalgia kind mm. of thing that must have been in the air at the time. But it does seem to have followed me. Uh, it's one that uh, obviously attracts yeah, attention. Sticks with you. Mm. Um, and then in... Uh, you, you uh, had quite a bit of uh, illustration uh, work mm. uh, on your desk and so on. 
But it wasn't until 2001 that uh, you hit the world uh, with a bang with, of course, uh, your first full-length uh, novel mm -hmm. called uh, Mortal Engines. Now, the first sentence of that, which is in effect also the first paragraph, is simply a few words. It says, it was a dark, blustery afternoon in spring, and the city of London was chasing a small mining town across the dried out bed of the old North Sea. Can you still, um, nine years on, can you still remember when that sentence first hit you? Uh, yeah, and it's actually, it's, it's more like 18 years on because I started right. writing Mortal Engines way back at the beginning of the 90s. It took sure. a long time to write and then a long time to find a publisher. Um, Yes, I, I'd been working for a lot, even then, I'd been working for probably three or four years trying to put together a sort of big rambling science fiction -y story of my own. And I knew the sort of thing I wanted, and I had some characters in mind, but it needed this kind of, it needed some sort of central image to build it round, some sort of hub for the whole story to revolve around. And for some reason, and I, I still don't know why, the, the, the notion of, of the the moving city on, on tracks just came, in, came into my mind one, one, one day. And all of a sudden thought, ping, moving city. And of course, the only reason to have a moving city is if all the other cities move and you want to chase them and, and you know, grab bits off them and, and, and use them to make your moving city bigger and stronger. So instantly, it wasn't just the, the image of the city, but of this whole kind of social structure, this whole food chain of municipal Darwinism. Um, and, and that sentence is, is, is the, um, the sort of, uh, I suppose that, I'm, uh, that, that is the, the crystallization mm -hmm. of that kind of first image I had. And although, I mean, the book was rewritten endlessly yeah. um, over the ensuing um, decade, but I think that first sentence stayed pretty much unchanged. Uh, I think that uh, anyone in the audience who uh, sees him or herself as a children's writer and we always have, have some in an audience like this, uh, should I think take some consolation from the fact that I understand this book went through 25 drafts? Is that literally correct? I'm, I'm sure it was at least that many. I mean, I, um, I may have plucked the figure 25 out of the air in some mm. interview. I can't quite remember. I, I, you know, I wasn't keeping a tally, but I write in a very un unstructured, unprofessional way, I guess. I don't really plan ahead. I don't know where I'm going. I just start writing, and, and I keep going until it all goes wrong or I'm, I find the story isn't turning out as I hoped, and then I throw it away and I start again, uh, retaining the good bits. Um, so consequently, I do sometimes need to go through many, many, many attempts before I end up with something that's reasonably close to what I was, what I was aiming for. Or something that's nothing like what I was aiming for, but which is quite good anyway, hopefully. Um, I yes. always think, uh, on an occasion like this, it's quite tricky talking about these books in one particular sense. Uh, you don't want, in any sense, to spoil mm. the story for anyone who hasn't yet met the books. Uh, and therefore, I, I don't want to go in too closely, as it were, to the, the storyline, the narrative, uh, about the two young people who are at the heart of this. Uh, but Hester, uh, the, the young woman in the story, uh, it's not giving away any, any, big, any big fact about Hester to say that uh, she is uh, not the most uh, physically prepossessing no, of young no. women. And it must therefore, I would have thought, uh, been quite a challenge to create a principal character along those lines. Um, I don't know that I saw it that way, particularly. Mm. I think I, my intention with Mortal Engines was always to do something that, that happily reveled in all the clichés of, of, mm. of the science fiction I'd read as a, yeah. as a, as a, as a yeah. child and a young man. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to kind of give them a little bit of a spin of my own. Mm. And one of the obvious, one of the first things I thought I would get rid of is the beautiful heroine. Yes. Because who cares yeah. about beautiful people? They are beautiful. Um, I, don't, I don't care what happens to them, frankly. Yes, they can look um, after themselves. Yes, they can look after themselves. The world will be kind to them. Um, so I thought I would have a plain heroine. Um, and of course, that, that, you know, that, that sort of has echoes of, of Jane Eyre and, and um, uh, Esther Summerson in Bleak House, who um, is 
I think probably where Hester's name comes from. Um, and then I thought, um, I thought actually, why not? I think, I think as the story developed, it sort of made sense that her, her um, appearance had been scarred, just like the rest of her, yes. by something that the, the villain has done to yes. her. Um, so she, I, th I think in the early draft, she had a sort of a, a scar down one side of her face. And then I thought I was doing that kind of Hollywood thing where, you know, she's got a scar, but actually she's really pretty. So I thought I would, um, I thought I had, if I was going to do that, I had to do it properly. So the scar goes right across and she hasn't really got a nose to speak of, which is never a good look, I think. So, um, so I, I really, you know, and, and then it became, I suppose it was a challenge, but in a pleasurable way yeah. to make her as, as ugly as I could. Yes. Um, and... I quite like that idea that when, when the hero first sees her, he is yes. you know, literally, yes. as you would be, uh, repelled. Yes. Um, but then gradually he comes to, um, he comes to understand her and, 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 and to love her yes. in the end. Yes. I, I, indeed, because by the time we reach uh, the last paragraph, uh, which, like so much of your writing on what, I know it's not the best word, but on, on the romantic dimension of these books, and there is a lot of relationship uh, going on in, in various guises, but uh, it's beautifully controlled and measured. Um, she knelt, this is the last uh, paragraph, uh, she knelt beside him, resting her arms on his knees and her head on her arms, and Tom found that he was smiling in spite of himself at her crooked smile. You aren't a hero, and I'm not beautiful, and we probably won't live happily ever after, she said. But... We're alive and together, and we're going to be all right. Now, that is a beautifully measured ending. It must have taken you ages that, to think that of that. That did take, that last paragraph, that must have gone through many more than 25 <laughs> yes. drafts. Um, yes. I, I spent weeks on yes. that. But yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's also in another uh, dimension altogether uh, to go back to the point I was making about names, because uh, one of the... Um, locations that uh, Philip devises for this book is what he calls a, the piratical suburb of Tunbridge Wheels. And uh, we meet in three or four lines the various councillors. Uh, Tom and Hester are given a guided tour of the town hall and introduced to the councillors who are described as a rough-looking gang with names to match. Janny Mags and Thick Mungo and Standfester Zem, Pogo Nadgers, and Zip Risky, and the Traction Grab Kid. Zip Risky sounds as if there might be possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> or not, <laughs> depending. Um, when you had written this, or when you were starting this, or whatever, uh, had you the quartet in mind? No, not at no. all, no. I mean, I, I had no idea um, or expectation that it would ever get published. I really just did it as a hobby. Um, I was working pretty much full-time as an illustrator throughout the time I was writing it, and um, on my days off and in the sort of the downtime between doing the roughs for a job and then doing the finished artwork, sometimes there was a week or two there, I would, I would tinker away with Mortal Engines. And um, no, I, I didn't imagine it being published. And then it got to a stage where I thought, well, this is the best thing I've ever come up with, so I really ought to try and get it published. Um, and that seemed to involve endlessly sending it off and getting it rejected and rewriting it and rewriting it. And I was really so sick of it by the end that I, I just wanted it to be done and finished and published. And I thought, that'll be it. I'll have a book out. My mum can buy a copy. Well, I might give her one. Um, maybe, you know, a couple of other people will buy it. And that'll be it. And I'll go back to illustration. So I had no notion at all of doing any more. And I tried to cram all the ideas I had for it into that first book. And it was only really when Scholastic had agreed to publish that um, and said, oh, is there going to be a sequel? That I thought, oh, right, I've got to do it all again. So, um, so it was only really then that I started to think of even writing another book at all, let alone another Mortal Engines book. And how did you juggle uh, the production of those four titles with the more or less concurrent production of your three Larklight books? <coughs> um, I don't think it was quite concurrent, um, although it may have ended up Being in publication published like terms yes. concurrently. Yes. Um, 
Lark light was an idea that, that actually goes back far further than mortal engines. There are elements in lark light that go back to things I was um, writing when I was still at school or at sixth form. Um, so it's an idea that was always kicking around, and it's, it's a sort of, it's a kind of um, lightweight Victorian space opera, basically. <laughs> it's, it's set in an imaginary 1850, where, um, thanks to Isaac Newton making some, um, some interesting discoveries in, in alchemy, uh, the, the British Empire extends all the way to, um, to Jupiter. Um, and I, I'd sort of been thinking about it for a long time. The, the trouble with it as an idea was that it's silly. It's very, very silly, and it didn't hold. It, didn't, it wouldn't carry any weight. I couldn't use it to make some sort of deep comment about imperialism or anything because it's silly, and it would just collapse under the weight of that kind of stuff. And then I decided that the way to do it would be as an illustrated book, and that would give it a kind of raison d'etre, and it wouldn't matter that the story is as, as light as a souffle. Um, so really, I think I ended up writing that, and I can't remember quite how it fitted in in terms of the... Uh, the Mortal Engines mm. books, but as I remember it, I, I wrote Lark Light as a kind of reaction to Mortal Engines, because the Mortal Engines quartet does get quite bleak and quite dark in some ways towards the end, and um, I thought it was nice coming off that to this sort of happy, lightweight comedy story, basically. Uh, one of the things that's uh, immediately obvious about the, those three books, of course, is uh, how beautifully produced they mm. are. And for anyone, again, in, in, in the audience who, who is completely new to these books, uh, they all come, and I quote the, the, the cover, decorated throughout by David Wyatt. And uh, Mr. Wyatt's uh, illustrations run to uh, made-up adverts from the Victorian age and all that sort of thing. But in addition to that, uh, there are illustrations throughout and also uh, the most beautiful a tongue-in-cheek uh, end notes, if you like, uh, including, I was delighted to see in uh, Moth Storm, a selection of charming reviews inspired by the Larklight series from some of the nation's esteemed houses of journalism. And I'm delighted to say the Irish <laughs> Times figures uh, en passant, very much so. I, there must, I take it, uh, Philip B., um, a very considerable degree of collaboration between you and Mr. Wyatt. Mm. Um, oddly enough, to start with, um, no, because uh, I, didn't, I didn't know David when I, when I started writing this, though my idea for it was always that it would be illustrated mm. and that it would have these sort of fake Victorian adverts in the front. I wanted it to feel as if it was an artefact from the world that it's set in. You know, this is the sort of book that Art and Myrtle would read. <laughs> um, so I had this very clear idea of what, what, what it should be, and Bloomsbury recommended various illustrators to me, and um, David Wyatt was the one who um, was, you know, clearly the best. I thought he draws um, the way that I could, I would draw if I could draw in the way that I would like to be able to draw. <laughs> um, so, and, and he does it very, very quickly. And he seems to have this knack of he'll 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 draw something that I describe, and I don't have to give him any direction at all. He just does it, and there it is. The thing has kind of come out of my imagination onto a sheet of paper. Um, and if it doesn't look exactly as I imagined it, um, it looks better. And then I can change the text to, to include anything that he's added. Um, so the first one, I suppose, he did pretty much as a, as a straight illustration job. He was handed the text, and he, he, he just got to work on it. But it turned out that he actually lives quite close to me in Chagford, up on the, the north end of Dartmoor, um, which is a sort of illustrator's enclave they've got up there. And, um, and so on the second and third, it was, it was quite easy for us to meet up and, and plan things. And David's ideas started to become quite important. He would, he would sit, a, sit at home in the evening sketching strange people and places. And, uh, and I would look through his sketchbooks later and think, oh, yes, we'll have him and him and him. And I'd write them into the story. So it became actually quite a serious collaboration. And I would have liked it, it very much. I mean, it's nice that it says decorated throughout by David Wyatt. But I, I think by the time we get to Mothstorm, what it should really say is by Philip Reeve and David Wyatt. <laughs> Uh, we're going to leave uh, Fever Crumb and your new book, A Web Affair, mm. uh, for a moment or so, uh, because I want to move on to your Carnegie uh, winner, uh, Here Lies Arthur. And uh, I remember uh, a review in Books for Keeps by Jeff Fox, uh, which ended with uh, the, the, the summary, summarizing sentence, 
and Arthur for our time. Mm. And I wondered, A, A, if you agreed with that, and B, if you had set out very deliberately to create, quote, an Arthur for our time. Um, well, I, I suppose all Arthurs are, are an Arthur for our time. And when, you know, when Mallory wrote his mm. um, um, Mort d'Arthur, it was an Arthur for his time. Um, I, I didn't specifically set out to do that. I set out to do an Arthur that wasn't quite like all the other hundreds and hundreds of versions of King Arthur there are around. It was, a, it was something I very much wanted to do um, because I'd been pretty much obsessed by the Arthurian legend when I was at college. Um, so I had this great sort of bed of knowledge about it and I felt I ought to use that and I, I, I really wanted to. Um, but there are so many other versions of it that it was, it was, um, it was difficult to know where to start. So um, what I tried to do was, um, was to do a sort of a, a historical Arthur, to set him in the time where he existed, if he existed at all, which would have been post-Roman Britain, this sort of collapsing former Roman province being invaded by the Saxons and the Irish and the Scots. Um, and, and all, you know, breaking up into little warring factions and, and minor kingdoms, petty kingdoms. And um, certainly Arthur has, Mary Stewart and, and Rosemary Sutcliffe have, have both, I think, set Arthur stories in, in that sort of environment. But as far as I'm aware, they've always shown Arthur as quite an impressive figure. Um, even if he was in, the, in this quite barbaric background, he's always been a great leader, at least. Um, and I thought it might be interesting if he wasn't a great leader at all, if he was, if he was Tony Soprano, basically. <laughs> I mean, not even that good. He's a, he's a sort of minor gangster. Um, he's, he's somehow got command of a little unit of, of Roman heavy cavalry left over from some British army. And, um, and, and he rides around the, uh, the West Country, um, beating people up and burning down villages and demanding protection money, basically, demanding taxes and, and making a little, a little tiny little squalid kingdom for himself, and which, which I imagine a great many warlords and, and, and people were doing at that time. And uh, the difference, of course, between Arthur and all the others is that Arthur has, has Mervyn on Berlin, who is his bard and acts as his spin doctor, um, which is where I suppose the Arthur for our time comes in. Uh, it, it's, it's this notion of, of spin. And it wasn't really until I was in the middle of writing it, that because I'm quite dim and I don't pay a lot of attention to current affairs and stuff, <laughs> um, and I suddenly thought, oh, yes, actually, this is exactly what Tony Blair is up to. Um, you know, to, to, to tell stories about himself, really. Um, so, so, so Arthur will do these little petty, brigandly things and Mervyn goes around telling everybody that he's won great battles and defeated giants and stuff. And, of course, they believe it. And, and so Arthur's power and prestige are increased. And that's the, um, that's the notion behind it. Uh, it, it so it really became, it became topical kind of by accident. Um, but I'm very glad it did. I'm happy it became topical. That's, that's, that's very nice. But I hope, I hope that as time moves on and spin and things are forgotten, I hope that it will still... Um, you know, still be readable as, as just another, you know, a, a slightly different take on Arthur. Mm -hmm. in, in many ways also, it's, uh, it strikes me anyway as being the most adult of your books uh, in, <laughs> in terms of uh, <coughs> its themes, such as uh, high emotion, sexuality, mm -hmm. indeed disloyalty and so on. And I think you're going to read us a short excerpt mm -hmm. that sure. brings that yes. out to the foremost. Yes, I mean, you... You can't really escape from the fact that the Arthur story is about sex and violence, basically. So there was no, there was no avoiding it, and mm. I didn't try to. And I, 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 it is my most adult mm. book, I guess. Um, this is a section. Basically, it's narrated. If you, if you don't know the book, it's narrated by a girl called Gwynna, who is sometimes disguised as a boy called Gwyn, who is Mervyn's apprentice, and she sees all of this story unfolding. And um, here she is. Um, She's just discovered the illicit relationship between Arthur's wife, Guinevere, and um, Bedwyr, who is a young, a young man in Arthur's war band. What is Bedwyr thinking? Why can't he see the danger? I want to grab him in the street, push him into a doorway, and say, Bedwyr, it's me. Look, your old friend Gwyn. 
Say she can't be worth it. Don't you understand what will happen when Arthur finds out? But he does understand. He likes the danger. He's been trained for danger, lived for danger all his life, been taught to go and seek it out on battlefields and in the hunt. And this summer past, it's all been taken from him. The best future he can hope for is to be a half-man, riding patrol along the field banks, watching over Arthur's cows and barley, the pain in his bad leg always souring him. Guinevere makes him feel like a man again. Arthur has no use for a broken warrior, but Arthur's wife has. Each morning when he goes out to see the horses in their stable behind his brother's house, he looks across the smoky slope of the town to her roof and thinks of her asleep beneath it. The hope of meeting her is what pulls him through each day. Sometimes, if she's going out into the meadows or to visit some friend who lives outside the walls, she sends for him and he puts on his red cloak and rides out as her bodyguard and there is something thrilling about being so near her and not being able to touch her or say more than the idle pleasantries that are expected between a young warrior and the wife of his lord. He can't even catch her eye for fear her maidens will notice some glance, some glint. He does his duty in a daze, like a sleepwalker, knowing that when the twilight comes he'll slip away to meet her at the baths and they'll say all the things they couldn't say by day. Let's face it, he's in love. Like a hero out of one of those stories Mervyn tells in the feast hall, he is in love with her hands, with her slender fingers and the creases of her knuckles. He is in love with the faint hair on her upper lip, which he can feel but barely see. He is in love with the downy hollow of the small of her back, with the hard jut of her shoulder blades like the stubs of wings. He is in love with her eyelids. He is in love with her voice. He is in love with her kindness. He is in love with the soft sound of her breath when she lies drowsy in his arms. He is in love with the nape of her neck. He is in love with the girl she was before he was even born. He is in love with her because she's not some girl, some silly maid no older than himself who giggles and wants presents. Guinevere wants only him. She's chosen him. She watches him so intently when they are together. She takes him so seriously. And isn't that what all boys want? And all men too just to be taken seriously. And isn't that just what all boys want? Um, you see, that is what, I'm not just saying this because we're sitting beside <laughs> one another, but that is how it strikes me uh, if you're going to have uh, sexuality in books for teenagers. That's how you do it. It's about subtlety, it's about suggestion, and of course it's about terribly, terribly uh, carefully chosen uh, language. Uh, to return then to the um, Mortal Engines and, and the two prequels mm. that have followed it, namely Fever Crumb and your new book, A Web of Air, at what stage uh, in the uh, process, uh, Philip, did the idea of uh, let's have a prequel appear to you? Well, um, I'm not quite sure when it, when it, when it arrived. It, um, when I finished Darkling Plain, which is the, the last of the quartet, I thought I was done. I thought I was finished. I thought the story had pretty much, um, all the loose ends had pretty much been tied up, and I wanted to move on and do different things, and I, I did. I did Here Lies Arthur and Larklight and things. Um, but the world of Mortal Engines is... It's sort of my world. It's the, it, 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 I created it over a very long period, and it's got all the things I like in it. And if I wanted to keep on writing about all those things that I like, th those particular sorts of names and things, I, I thought I had to really return to that world, or otherwise create a different world that would just be a kind of pale imitation of Mortal Engines. So, um, so I thought the thing to do would be to leave the original story where it was, that's complete and finished, but I thought if I moved back to a much earlier era of the same world, um, there would be new stories to be told, and new, not just new stories, but um, new issues to explore. It's about different things, the, the, the fever crumb, the, the, the developing fever crumb sequence. It's got different concerns to the, to the original books, and, um, and I, hope they feel, I hope they feel quite different. I, I, I wasn't planning to try and recreate Mortal Engines, you're not going to meet any of the same characters, well, one of the same characters, but it's set so far before the original books that, that there's not going to be any crossover in the characters. It's not going to be like sort of Star Wars, where the prequels eventually butt up to the, the beginning of the original first 
story. It's, um, it's, a, it's kind of its own thing, I hope. But it's those two books that, uh, more than the quartet, the Mortal Engines quartet, that strike me, that strike me at least, as being more engaged with what you were talking about some time ago, namely the interest in engaging with ideas. Because some of the ideas, especially in the new book, A mm -hmm. Web of Air, really are uh, quite complex. And I think uh, the main reason for that is that in this young, she's 14, I think, 14-year-old mm. uh, woman, Fever, uh, she herself is a very, very complex young woman. And a part of the reason for this is that it seems to me, especially again in book two, in A Web of Air, uh, she is subject to all sorts of uh, struggles within herself about this, this uh, contrast between, if you like, the traditional and the non-conformist, uh, between the fact that she has been brought up by the engineers people to be rational, and yet there is a whole irrational world out there. Mm. And it, that irrational world out there is, I think, uh, beautifully handled in A Web of Air uh, by the inclusion at the beginning, and then later on it comes back, of this uh, travelling theatrical group. And Dickens seems to have figured once or twice in our conversation, but what it reminded me of very much in its effect, I mean, uh, is the role of uh, Sleary Circus in Hard Times, where for these people, you know, who have been brought up to look at the world in a certain way, this represents a, a tremendous release. But uh, in A Web of Air, uh, on the question of ideas, uh, there really is, uh, there are many uh, challenging sentences and full of ideas, uh, but towards the end, um, Fever, who I should explain is a foundling, so has also the, I, the, the business, the difficulty of finding her parents eventually, as well as the, the, the town story, the archaeological story, if you like. Uh, but Fever eventually meets up with uh, her mother, and um, the mother says, uh, if you really, uh, Fever says, uh, uh, the mother says to her, I beg your pardon, you're one of us, now be sensible. I am being sensible, said Fever. If you were sensible, you'd see that it can't work. If you really want to stop people thinking, you don't use guns or bombs, you use religion. And then later on, all over the world, all sorts of good things are banned and forbidden in the name of one religion or another. You can uh, just bribe a few priests. It's the job of priests to control knowledge and stand in the way of progress. It's what they're for. Well, I can assure you, not a million miles from here, those views would have a certain resonance. Um, and in fact, later on in the week, I understand we're to have Mr. Pullman with us. And for a moment, I think you're very nearly going into his sort of territory. Is that an idea you embrace? Well, I, um, I, I think it's very important in any sort of fiction and perhaps particularly in children's fiction, not to preach. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't write books to put my ideas mm -hmm. uh, of, of that, in that sense across, my political views or religious views mm -hmm. or anything. I, I, I really don't want to... I, I don't want to sort of be so, uh, standing on a soapbox mm -hmm. shouting at people. Um, that seemed to me to be how fever would feel. Mm -hmm. And I think there is, you know, I think there is a certain amount of truth in what she says. I, mm -hmm. I don't have a great problem with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far myself, mm -hmm. um, but Fever would, I mm -hmm. think, being, she's been brought up to be completely rational, she wants empirical evidence for things. <laughs> when she meets people who believe um, in, in God or, or whatever, or in things that have no apparent evidence, um, she's baffled and disgusted by them, yes. and she sees them as the enemy of all she stands for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have, I have Equally, in, 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 other, in earlier in, in the Mortal Engines Quartet, I've had characters who, um, who were quite religious and had mm. religious beliefs mm. and, and gained strength and courage from them. So, um, you know, I, I, hope, um, I hope that if you take the series as a whole, mm. it sort of balances out. Um, 
Does that answer the question? Oh, it I does. Sort of slightly <laughs> wandered, I feel. <laughs> well, on that topic in Ireland, of course, mm. we all wander. That right, it okay. explains why we're in the mess we're in. <coughs> um, but a uh, the, the, the very unsympathetic uh, woman uh, in uh, a web of air, would you agree, is... Uh, you know, the woman who comes along to the travelling theatricals and wants to censor the, everything. The priestess. It, the priestess, yes. 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 Mm. Um, you, you want her out of the way fairly quickly. Um, yeah, we, yes, I mean, she is an unsympathetic character. She, she, <laughs> she's, she's the... Um, and, and I'm not... You know, she's not a Christian right. priestess. She's the, the head of a mm. uh, ridiculous sea cult. Mm -hmm. um, and she is exactly as silly and as misguided as, as Fever um, <laughs> as Fever believes. So. Hey. In addition to the, uh, you know, the depth of the ideas that we've been talking about there recently, uh, this book again, I, I know it sounds trite to, to summarise it in these three words, but this book, among many other things, uh, a web of air I'm talking about, is a love story. It's the most tender love story between Fever and this young man, Arlo, whose obsession is to fly and the whole uh, tracing of the arc of the emotional relationship is, is beautifully done. And I almost challenge uh, anybody in the audience uh, to read the book and especially to read uh, the, few, uh, the last few pages of the story. Uh, not, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, not to reach for a handkerchief at some point it really is a highly touching, and I can't do more than that, it really is a highly touching conclusion to the destinies of uh, those two uh, people. Now, uh, Philip is going to read uh, a piece from a web of air that he himself has chosen, and uh, if time allows, I would like to uh, delight you uh, by reading a piece that I have chosen, a much shorter piece. So, Philip, off you go. Right. Um, this, this comes from fairly early on in the story. Um, the travelling theatre on which Fida is uh, working as sort of chief electrician has arrived in this, the, the, the city of Maida, um, a sort of Mediterranean harbour city built in a, a crater. And, um, and, and they're just getting ready for their first night's show, but something's gone wrong with the electrics. So Ruin, who is, is Fever's ward and assistant, little 10-year-old Ruin, has been sent out to find some copper wire. He flung himself up the steps at the backstage entrance and fell through the hatch into the bustle and commotion within. The air was thick with the smells of grease paint and armpits, the tiny stuffy corridors, a maze of shadows and confusion, lit by bobbing lanterns. Alison Froy was kneeling at the shrine, saying a pre-show prayer to the goddess Rada, who was supposed to watch over all theatre people. As Ruin dodged past her, Mad King Elvis of America loomed out of the darkness ahead of him, with his rhinestone armour all aglitter and his vast black wig grazing the passage walls on either side. Oh, this is just too beastly, darling, he complained. It's a disaster. This would never have happened if we'd stuck to using oil lamps and reflectors. Why did AP ever agree to let the girl electrify us? Ruin squeezed past him without answering. Cosmo lightly always found something to panic about before curtain up. He passed Dimpfner and Lilibet too, who were complaining in whispers that their careers would be ruined. And then Fern, who was to play one of the ladies in waiting in scene two and was busy practising her single line, Yes, my lady. Yes, my lady. Yes, my lady. In different voices, with her toy dog Noodle Poodle for an <laughs> audience. He scrambled down a companion ladder and ran aft, past the wood stacks and through the engine room where the big boilers slept in silence and the batteries hummed, then along a tight passageway and into the cramped burrow beneath the stage where Fever Crumb was waiting for him. And where Fever was, everything felt calm, even when it was a minute past curtain and not a footlight or a spotlight or a backstage glim lit anywhere in the Lyceum. And you could hear the crowd outside starting to make that mumbling, sullen sound that comes off disappointed crowds and the heavy footsteps of Master Persimmon crossing and recrossing the stage above your head as he paced about waiting to begin his first soliloquy. Fever came to meet him, lighting the way with the pocket torch she'd made for herself. She took the wire and smiled a thank you at him. She was fairly new to smiling, having been brought up among engineers who did not approve of it, and she wasn't really very good at it. She kept her lips tightly closed and her mouth went down at one end and up at the other. Some people might not have recognised it as a smile at all, but Rowan knew what it meant. 
He stood there feeling proud and happy, holding the torch for her while she went to the open fuse box, her clever fingers unwrapping the precise length of wire that she needed and twirling it round and round till it broke off the coil. She'd already stripped out the, the blown fuse. She wrapped the wire round this terminal, then round that, making a bridge for the electric particles to swarm across, while Ruin watched her. She was 16, tall and bony, with a strange face that was all angles, and large, watchful eyes that didn't match, one green, one brown. Her hair, which she punished with a hard brush every morning and scraped back into the tightest of buns, was every shade of fair from white to honey, and her old grey linen shirt and canvas trousers were smeared with oil and grease and stained with sweat. In Rowan's opinion, which no one ever asked him for, him being only ten, there was no one in the world as lovely as Fever Crumb. She glanced at him with a little frown, as if she was wondering why he was staring at her, and then reached for the lever on the wall that turned the power on. Anyone else would have crossed their fingers for luck at that moment, or said a prayer to Rada, but not Fever Crumb. She knew that crossing her fingers couldn't affect the universe, and she was always telling Ruin and his sister that there were no such things as gods or goddesses. But Ruin couldn't help himself. He crossed as many fingers as he could, behind his back where Fever couldn't see, and he said a prayer as well, not just to Rada, but to the gods of far-off London too, Poskett and Mad Isa and the Duke. The lever came down. The dim red working lights winked on. From outside came a noise like a big wave breaking, and Ruin realised that it was the sound of the audience applauding as the curtains suddenly flamed blood red in the glare of Fever's lights. Few people in Maida had ever seen such lights as these before. The knowledge of electricity had survived from ancient times before the downsizing, but like all the old knowledge, it was spread unevenly. Great cities such as London had buildings made of stone and salvage plastic, and lit at night by electric lanterns. But on the wild Atlantic coasts of World's End in those days, you were more likely to find grass-roofed huts and tallow candles. In some of the settlements which Bargetown had visited that season, people thought that its land barges were magic, and were wary of approaching too close for fear of the demons they thought they heard a growling and a griping in their engine rooms. The maidens were not so primitive as that, but they had a distrust of technology and they mostly did without engines and devices. They'd never seen anything like the clean, bright light that burst upon them as the Lyceum opened its curtains. The light grew brighter still, illuminating a stage dressed as a castle, with purple-headed mountains painted by Ruin and Fergus Bucket, stretching off into a smoky distance. A wind was blowing. That was Max Froy, standing in the wings, huffing into a conch shell and fanning dead leaves across the set. Clouds sailed across the painted sky, thanks to an invention of Fever's own, a disc with cloud shapes cut in it, spinning in front of one of her floodlights. Dappled by their shifting shadows, Niall's strong arm paced the battlements. A figure out of legend sprung to life, looking slightly older than most people had imagined him, but splendid nonetheless. Awed, the audience fell silent as he began his first speech. Fever and ruin, crouched in the cruel space beneath him, had other surprises in store. <coughs> Tall jars full of salt water surrounded them, each with an electric terminal in its base and another dangling into it on a wire. Electricity flowed from one terminal to the other through the water, completing a circuit which kept the lamps alight. But night was meant to be falling in the play, so while Cosmo lightly entered and started to tell Sir Niall of his plan to conquer the moon, Ruin pulled a cord which raised the dangling terminals higher and higher up inside the jars. With more water to flow through, the current grew weaker, partly spending itself as heat. The jars steamed. Up on stage, the light grew dimmer and dimmer. Cosmo raised one rhinestone arm and told the astro knight, So go you, good Sir Niall, to the moon. And tell its guardian goddess, even she must, to good King Elvis, bend her knee. Then Fever flipped a switch that turned on a masked spotlight and threw a perfect crescent moon onto the sky above the cardboard, cardboard parapets. Crouched between the simmering jars, she heard the audience's sigh and knew that she'd astonished them again. That pleased her. Unlike Ruin, she'd never fallen for the magic of the theatre and still thought that plays were so much silly nonsense but she hoped that maybe there would be someone out there in that crowd who would be more moved by the brilliance of her lights than by the silly love story unfolding under them and would look into electricity for themselves and come to see how simple it was, really, to generate and harness. Then she would have played a small part in restoring science and reason to this backward portion of the world. Or maybe that was just an excuse, a kindly lie, she told herself, to help her deal with the fact that Fever Crumb 
trained in the ways of science and reason by London's Order of Engineers, but she liked to think that she did it rather well. <laughs> well, as you will have gathered, uh, one little detail from that uh, that Philip has just read, uh, Fever uh, wears her hair uh, scraped back into a bun, and a very tight bun as well. And one of the reasons for this, the main reason, in fact, is that because of her upbringing with the engineers, who are supremely rational people, uh, she has been led to believe that uh, letting your hair down, so to speak, is a supremely irrational act. But she meets Arlo, and Arlo sees the world and sees hair through slightly different eyes. He said, you never unfasten your hair. What? Fever put a hand in the hard bun at the back of her head. What does that have to do with anything? She wondered if he was thinking of using her hair as some sort of pennant so that he could gauge the speed and direction of the wind. Surely his own was long enough. Even when you go to sleep, said Arlo, sometimes a bit comes loose but you always tie it straight back. Hair is irrational, said Fever. It is a vestige of our animal past. I had to grow mine when I left the head just to stop people staring, but that does not mean that. He came round and stood close to her. He reached out and she felt his fingers busy at the nape of her neck, unraveling the careful knot she'd tied. She knew that she ought to protest but when she tried to speak, no words came out, just a little sigh, a little gasp. And then the knot was undone, and around her face in wisps and strands, her dry, sun-bleached hair came tickling down. He combed his fingers through it, arranging it for her, his hands brushing against her throat and her ears and the angles of her jaw. I do not approve, she started to say but she could not remember what it was that she did not approve of. She touched his face, tracing all the beautiful patterns of his freckles, thinking, this is not rational, I am forgetting myself. But might it not be pleasant to forget oneself for a little while? Might it not be pleasant to give in to these fierce and hungry feelings? The smells of Arlo's body flowered in her mind as sprays of nameless colour. She supposed that she was falling in love. That was what Dimpna or Lilibet would call it. And although she knew it must just be a matter of chemicals and instincts, it still felt wonderful and frightening and strange. She leaned towards Arlo until her faces touched. I am supposed to kiss him now, she thought, thinking of all the love scenes he had watched through her periscope from her lair under the Lyceum stage. I wonder how kissing works. <laughs> and that, I, I mean that, I don't know how many lines that is, but two phrases, sun-bleached hair, her sun-bleached hair came tickling down. Tickling down. Think of the work that must go into choosing a verb such as that, if, it, if a verb is what it is. Uh, your uh, last book but one, uh, Philip, uh, a very different sort of book altogether, really, I would say. Uh, no such things as dragons. And you referred earlier in talking, I think, about Arthur uh, to, uh, you know, truth-telling and fiction and the purpose of story. Uh, this would seem to me to be a fable, uh, very much dealing with those topics. When are you telling the truth? When are you telling lies, etc.? Mm. I suppose, yes. I mean, I, it has got some things in common with, with Arthur, not least the sort of medieval, mm. legendary... Um, element. Um, I think I, I try to I try to alternate books ideally because I think there's a danger in writing series titles that you get sort of locked into it, and you're always writing a book whose beginning was in another book and whose end will be in a further book. Um, so I like to try and do a standalone one um, between Fever Adventures, um, and no such thing as dragons was one of those. And it's basically, well, I, you know, I'm glad it reads as a fable, but I'm afraid to me it was just a big silly action movie. Um, <laughs> it's, about a, it's about a fake medieval dragon slayer who goes around the Alps in, um, or some range of high mountains at some distant time in the past when everybody believed there were dragons up there 
and he, um, he makes a living by, um, by promising the people of the mountains that he's brave enough and he can go up this mountain and he can slaughter their dragon for them. Um, but of course, this being one of my books, he inevitably goes up a mountain where there actually is a dragon of some, or some sort of um, nasty large beast. It's a kind of a, it seems to be a, a dinosaur that survived rather too long and is, is still up there on the mountain and wants to eat him and his young assistant. So it, it, uh, at that point, it turns into sort of jaws up a mountain, basically. <laughs> um, but apparently it's a fable, so that's great. Oh, it's a fable. <laughs> uh, <coughs> before uh, we uh, conclude uh, my own part of this, I just want to ask one last question, uh, if, if you would like to divulge, that is, uh, what uh, you were talking about, you like to alternate your books and themes, it, what can we look forward to? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, having said that, also, I have already started work on a third Fever book. Mm -hmm. um, I think because Web of Air feels so different to the others in its setting and its mm -hmm. content that, um, that it didn't really feel like a Mortal Engines book. So, so I, I've sort of happily gone, on to, gone into another one, another one set in that world. Um, I keep feeling I ought, to, I ought to have a go at Robin Hood. Now I've sorted out King Arthur. I ought to... I ought to <laughs> By Robin Hood, but I, you know, obviously don't want to take the same approach. But mm. I think there's something to be, something to be done there. Um, <coughs> Robin Hood is he tends in, in modern retellings to be presented as a sort of um, a sort of early socialist, a kind of up the workers um, <laughs> person, redistributing wealth. But actually, if you look at the original stories, he's a, a he's a very conservative figure. Mm -hmm. He's a, a right wing figure, um, uh, uh, running off into the liberties of the greenwood to escape from the. Uh, Escape from the, the government of the day and the taxes and things. So I thought that might be quite interesting, a right-wing Robin Hood. Um, so that might happen one day. And I have various other ideas that sit around. I, I, I have an idea about um, early Hollywood, which never seems, to, it never seems to get beyond a couple of sort of basic images. I, I, think, I think there was a nice story to be told in, um, in the very, very early days of, of silent movie making. But I suspect it probably needs Geraldine McCorcoran to tell it rather than me. So I don't know whether that'll get off the ground or not. Um, I hope Fever will keep going and her various little chums for yes. quite some time. I think Mortal Engines is its getting to a point now. I think in the next book, we'll see London start moving. And mm -hmm. it'll sort of be linked in that sense to the rest of the sequence. Um, and after the, once that's happened, then I think I'm free to go off and explore all sorts of corners of the world that I haven't touched yet. So at that point, Mortal Engines will change and I'll be able to do all kinds of different things in it. So I'm quite looking forward to that. And so are we, I am sure. Um, we have time for perhaps a couple or three <coughs> questions from the audience, if anyone would <coughs> like to raise something. Yes. I'm, I'm pretty happy where I am, I think. I don't, I don't know what I could do in adult fiction. I, I, I don't feel that there's, there's some great thing that I want to do that I can't do uh, at the moment. I'm, I'm, I think this is about my level, really. Um, it, it is. And also, even the restrictions are sometimes nice. Um, I mean, the, the piece that Robert just read about the hair, um, it, it struck me that if you were writing an adult novel you'd probably just write a big old sex scene there, which mm. would be much too embarrassing to read. And um, <laughs> writing for children, you're kind of forced back into, into the sort of like the Victorian kind of thing, where immense significance and, and sort of eroticism, I suppose, attaches to tiny, tiny little innocent actions. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting example of, of a, a restriction um, actually becoming um, a huge freedom. So, uh, yeah, I like, I like both the freedoms and the restrictions of, of writing for young people. Mm. Yes? What do you read for pleasure now? What do I read for pleasure now? When I am writing a story, um, and this didn't always used to be the case, but I find that um, I can't really concentrate on fiction very much because I'm always kind of looking at it through the screen of the story I've just been working on. So I tend to mostly be reading non-fiction at the moment, and then between, between books I kind of um, go into my great stack of, of sort of literary novels and other young adult authors whose work I feel I really ought to read. Um, <coughs> at the moment it's mostly science and history, I'm afraid, um, which, is, which is good. Make some recommendations. Oh, I can't. Moment, uh, Simon Sharma, Landscape and Memory, which is history, I guess, not really science, also art. Excellent book, endless, endless um, 
source of inspiration. Uh, Landscape and Memory by Simon Sharma. <coughs> yes. Um, well, I could, I could see it happening in the sense that um, the sort of film rights have been bought, and I guess at some stage somebody might um, be bothered to make a film out of them, possibly. Um, but it's not really anything to do with me anymore. You know, once that process has happened, it's, it's out of my hands completely. So um, I, I almost don't have an opinion on it, to be honest. In some ways it would be nice, and in other ways I'm quite happy to, um, you know, just have the books be themselves. Yes, Arshid. Um, science fiction seems to be going through a very nostalgic phase at the moment. Steampunk is very big, and your, your work is very influenced by old references. Mm. Um, do you think, I mean, we're living in a kind of science fiction world, do you, where do you think it could go next? What do you think the next generation will be? <coughs> what flavour it will have? I, I, I myself, I'm getting very, very tired of, uh, of, of steampunk, of the sort of neo-Victorian stuff. At the time, you know, when I started writing Mortal Engines, that seemed to be, there didn't seem to be a lot of it around. But now it's absolutely ubiquitous. Even on sort of children's television programmes, they all have airships and valves and hissing steam pipes and things. So personally, I want to move away from that. If I, if I write any non-Mortal Engines related sci-fi in future, it is going to involve actual science. I think the problem is, and this is just a personal theory, but I think most of the people writing um, uh, science fiction these days are probably arts graduates who know nothing about science <laughs> and, <laughs> and they can't understand. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm hugely guilty of this. I cannot understand the, the science of today. Um, so I look back with nostalgia to the science of the 19th century, which, you know, if you look at the machines for long enough, you can work out what they're doing. And, and the, you know, uh, it, they're quite simple for people to understand. Flight, the flying machine in, in this book, is, is, it's, it's, it would work. You know, it's quite easy to understand when you, when you actually read the material. It's easy to understand how things fly. Um, it's not easy to understand how a computer works or, um, or a, a large hadron collider. Or a microphone. Or a microphone, indeed. Um, and the people who do understand science and write science fiction, it's incomprehensible to everybody else. So it's becoming this strange sort of little niche market. Um, so I, I think that's probably what's gone wrong. And I, I don't know, really. I, I think science fiction is going to sort of continue in, in, on the, along those two roads. You'll get the kind of the nostalgic fantasy end stuff. And you'll get the... Um, rather abstruse things about, um, you know, particle physics and, exotic and exotic matter and stuff, um, which will appeal only to a very small um, audience. So I think possibly, I think probably, you know, the days of science fiction as a, as a great and influential genre are gone, um, except in sort of mainstream stuff like Avatar, which is sort of science fiction, but it's, it's science fiction used as a... As a, as a metaphor, as a fable, rather than any actual science really going on, except in the production design and stuff. Um, so I think, yeah, I think, I, th I, think um, I think that's how I see it working out, really, this sort of division just expanding and continuing. I, I doubt we'll ever get back to a stage, as it was in the 50s and 60s, where, where science fiction in that sense was quite exciting and, and, and had quite a big readership um, and, and taught people about science. You know, I, 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 what little I do know about science, I, I picked up from you know, Robert Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and people, um, and I'm and, and grateful to them for that. Yes? Uh, many of your books, are, uh, as was mentioned, are very beautifully illustrated, beautiful physical objects in themselves. And I, uh, I, I just wonder how you feel, do you feel happy or sad about the idea of those physical objects transforming into purely electronic texts and the, the idea perhaps the, the, the beauty of the idea that tens of thousands of years from now the physical text could, could still survive but perhaps the, the electronic text on the reader would be uh, inaccessible. Do you, have, do you have thoughts about in general that, that move uh, of literature away from the physical object? Of the well of, form? of course coming from the generation that I do having grown up with with books printed on dead trees, I am um, saddened 
to think that they'll soon be gone. Um, but I don't think people of, uh, growing up now will be particularly worried about that. And, um, and certainly future generations, they, they, they will feel no nostalgia for these things. These are a passing, a passing phase of culture, like long playing records. I quite miss those as well, but you know, young people today, young people today they don't know what they were, you know, and they don't care, and it probably doesn't really matter. They can still hear the, the stuff that was on them. I, I, I mean, I think what's important is that what, what I would be sad about, and what I think is a greater danger, is that the novel itself will cease to be a, a, an important part of our culture. I think, I think once you get to the stage of reading things on a screen and it's all interactive and there are sort of links embedded in it and things, I think it, I think it will create different reading patterns. I think maybe people won't, won't want to read something of this length anymore. Um, there's no way of, or certainly no way of me, for, for me to, to predict it. Um, I, you know, if, if people are reading great big books on an on a iPad or some, some similar but better device, you know, if they have a great library of classic novels on there, then that would be great, and it doesn't particularly really bother me. I can't honestly claim that that's a great loss, that it's in electronic form instead of paper. But if it comes to a point where they're, they're, reading, they're, they're just playing games or they're, they're reading stories in some new form that hasn't uh, yet been devised, and the novel is dead and gone, and, and, um, or, or is kind of a niche thing like, like, like opera, um, then I think that would be... That would be very saddening. And I do fear that it, it's a possibility. I think we have time for one more. Anyone? Yes. Uh, I've been fascinated from the beginning um, that a male writer has the strongest protagonist, a female, a juvenile female. Um, you know, in, in mm. Hester and the winner and now Fever. And I just wondered why you chose the match. Um, well, I, I didn't really choose it. it, it choose it. It chose me. Um, I think. I think the, the, the sort of character, the, the character who's kind of me in a book, um, the, the character I'm most concerned with and, and who I see most of it through, um, I quite like to make that a girl because then it doesn't feel as if I'm writing about myself, and then I can write about myself, but I'm kind of in disguise. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> so um, I think that's one reason, and the other. I mean. Um, I think, um, I, I, I think girls are stronger than boys. That, that may, maybe that's because I'm male, but I have that opinion. And it may be completely wrong, but I, I, you know, that's my feeling. Um, I think that's probably all I can, all I can say about, about, about that, really. It's, it's not a, it hasn't been a deliberate choice. It's been an accident. And when I, when I wrote Larklight, kind of trying to do what I had, you know, do the opposite of Mortal Engines, I, I, I did put in a sort of a, a weak and weedy, flimsy, screamy sort of a girl. Um, but in her own strange way, she kind of becomes very strong as well and, um, and rather domineering in her, in her helpless, helpless way. So it does seem to keep happening. I'm, I don't know why. Well... Yes. I was just going to ask, do you ever, um, do, before you go to publish it, do a read around, say, with a bunch of teenagers or not? No, no, do never. You don't actually try it out on a live wing? You know, no, 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 no. Um, I, I, um, it, um, I may be going wildly off message, but I don't actually care what they think. <laughs> um, I, um, I, uh, I think the great thing about a novel that makes it better than the, you know, a better experience to create a novel than, than making a film or something is that it is the work of one person, um, really. I mean, you know, I, I show it to my editors and they'll sort of point out things that don't quite make sense or, or you know, the spelling they're mistakes and stuff. No, no, they're not. But, um, but they are people <coughs> whose opinions I, I, I trust. Um, what would I, you know, if I'd written a book and I, I thought it was good and I show it to a teenager and they go, oh, that's really boring and we don't like her and that's rubbish. What would I do? Would I go away and change it and say, no, I don't think this is any good? No, my will is supreme, and it's the only one that matters to me. It sounds a bit like Morris Sandback, you know, when they had him, they had him on the site of um, where the wild, wild things are, and they said, you know, maybe this is a bit scary with the kids, and he said, well, I didn't like them anyway. Why shouldn't they be good, good, good things, and I, I mean, I aim to make good things. I don't want to sound too big-headed, but um, good things are not made by committees. They're made by individuals pursuing their own um, 
blind little alleys, and that's what I, that's what I try to do. Well, Mr. Reeve, sir, uh, may you go on pursuing your blind little <laughs> alleys for many years and many books, real books, uh, to come. I think it's been a most enlightening, uh, insightful evening, and I think we are all very much in your debt indeed. And uh, before we show our appreciation for your being here and for your engaging in this, uh, right at the very end of a web of air, uh, literally the last sentence, uh, when uh, Fever and Arlo do their different things, we read about Fever. There was nowhere for her to go now except home. And that applies to all of us and all of you. And thank you very much indeed for coming along. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.